Hello, Lisa Modridge talking. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be doing the first in my official schedule content history videos. So on a Wednesday, I will always be concerned with current affairs. I'm currently doing a playlist looking at what keeps the UK stable and looking at the UK redefining its relationship with the world. But it's my general belief that the past informs the present and geography drives history and geography doesn't change that much. And the further back you look, the more you find that things change, but they kind of always stay the same. So the Sunday playlist will be concerned with, I think what modern academics kind of laughably call the Silk Roads. Now the Silk Roads is a term that we use in the West to describe the economic, social and trading relationships between West and East. But over the course of lockdown, I did a course of study where I took the text from the Abrahamic faith. So that's the New Testament, the Old Testament and the Quran. I kind of learned a bit about how they were constructed, about the symbolism that's used in parables, and I kind of broke them down and placed them in the context of archaeological and linguistic evidence. And what I was very surprised to find was that as long as you don't take these texts literally, that they give you a fairly structured understanding of the development of civilization from pre-Sumerian kind of Mesopotamia, so this would be Eden, um, from the genetic kind of isolate that existed on the Armenian plateau, which I suppose would be the nearest equivalent to the Garden of Eden and the stories of Adam and Eve, kind of, and that these stories actually gave you a fairly reliable history of the development of civilization from ancient Mesopotamia up the Fertile Crescent, right through Egyptian domination, right up to the birth of the Classical Age, right up to the birth of Europe. But kind of when I started to look kind of a little bit, I decided once I had done this kind of thing that I was going to start to look further east. And what I had expected, because kind of we use this term Indo-European dispersal, I think I almost expected a mirror of this civilization development from this common route in Mesopotamia. But as I started to look at kind of China and the Indus Valley civilization and the civilizations kind of that we see evidence of in the, the steppes, the Mongolian steppe and the Eurasian steppe, I realized that what I was looking at was something much, much, much earlier. And that the city of Eridu, the Eden that's represented in the kind of Bible and the Quran, that this actually was a later development spurred on by a much earlier, much more sophisticated civilization further east. When I had been looking at the development of systems around Turkey and around Egypt and around the Levant right up into the kind of the birth of Europe, it had become apparent that the Eurasian and the Mongolian steppe were the important landmass to understand, going right back to the Neolithic development of Britain, Scandinavia, even the Americas, South, Central and North America. And that actually the nomadic people and the belief systems that had formed on the steppes when you start to look at Chinese history, you realize that you have no idea how old these civilizations are. There's um, a Chi uh, an academic called Min Li from Berkeley, who's really interesting, I'll put a lecture underneath, and he's explained that the shamanism that actually is still manifest in places like Siberia and in places like Tibet and Nepal and in kind of Northern China, actually, this was a fully fledged belief system and they don't know how old it was you find common tropes with the mountains. Um, these belief systems are defined by the mountains, by ancestor worship, by the rivers, the sacred groves that come to define kind of Celtic religion later on. And even the totem poles in the Americas have roots here. Now, when I was looking at the internal geography of China, you're looking at a civilization that's been shaped by two major rivers, the Yangtze and the Yellow River and also the coast of China and its tensions between civilizations shaped by these waterways that actually has shaped Chinese civilization. Now, China as a country have been historically quite stable. They're a country where you can use the fact that they have a strongly bureaucratic civil servant kind of culture, as well as strong dynastic threads to find a fairly reliable thread through Chinese history. The Han Dynasty period will tell you about the period which is covered by the Roman Empire. The Ming Dynasty will tell you about the period where colonial Western colonialism was impacting China. Um, we tend to believe that the first dynasty in dynastic China was a dynasty called the Zia dynasty. But what I found when I started looking at the artifacts and texts that were available to me, which were limited, 
was that actually the Zia dynasty were harking back to a much earlier civilization with roots at the Yellow River. Now the Yellow River is an immensely powerful, strong river that crosses China. And in its history, its management has been about civilizations learning to deal with flood. And you see the flood motif repeated in Chinese mythology, but in the ability to divert the course of this river and manage it that way by removing clay from the riverbed. And this is tremendously interesting. And this appears to have triggered, been part of what's triggered early development in China. And one of the most interesting ways to view the history of China is to look at ceramics. Now, when I'm looking for evidence of Mesopotamian civilization and trading relationships, I'm generally looking for a very distinctive type of pottery. And it's a type of ceramic called Ubaid pottery, and it's very distinctively decorated. And I had viewed this as like the roots of civilization. But when I started to look at Chinese ceramics, I realized that this Ubaid pottery was very much a cheap and poorer quality knockoff of some incredibly sophisticated, but earlier ceramics from here and also from the Indus Valley, and that there appears to have been contemporary development of the Indus Valley civilization and this civilization in China. I found that the foundation myth of um, the origin of kingship and divine authority in China centered around a goddess, again, called Nua. Nua, it was a story that echoes the later stories of the high priestesses in Mesopotamia. She has a divine consort. It's her ability to manage the river and this knowledge that comes down from the steppe and the mountains that allows the birth of Chinese civilization. There's a particularly interesting site called Mount Song, which has um, stepped pyramids that have built up over a very, very long period of time where there are incredibly early bronze artifacts, but a complete absence of bronze weaponry, but where sacred practices and ceremonial objects that have been cast in bronze are absolutely mind blowing. Now, I'm interested in mold making and casting generally. It took me a year to learn how to make one functioning two part mold. This civilization, who are clearly much earlier than the kind of three or 4,000 BC mushroom of civilization that we can see as the roots of civilization in ancient Mesopotamia, they are already using four to six part complex molds for, bra for bronze casting. And in fact, the very later um, bronze castings of Sargon of Akkad would appear to have used Chinese technology. It became very apparent when I was looking at the, geograph the, the geology of Mount Song that Mount Geghard, which is kind of one of the sacred sites that I'd identified when I was using these religious texts in Armenia, is very geologically similar to Mount Song. The technology that I had found on Lake Seven with a double blast furnace and the earliest metallurgy in 6000 BC had clearly come from China in this very much earlier civilization. Now, when I started to look at the text and the, the symbolism that was used, first of all, I, I found the earliest example of Chinese writing that I could see was on what was called an oracle bone. So it's linked to this shamanistic belief system. But the writing system that you can actually see on here is highly developed. You don't need to be a linguist to realize that this writing system has emerged over a long period of time. The symbolism in later texts about this earlier age is in a very clear symbolism of colors. Um, I think there's five colors with the first color being yellow and representing the very first dynasty in China. But this indicates that there had been a civilization with a five dynasty civilization attached to Mount Song and the Yellow River long before we had ever considered dynastic China. The mold making with the bronze cast items appears to have spurred on their ceramic development. The high finish of these bronze objects has required something to be done with the clay that's clearly come from the Yellow River, which has ended up with the development of porcelain, which we still use today and value very, very highly. The shapes coming from the molding process, which I will put underneath, and the kind of almost industrial kilns, even in the Bronze Age, this Bronze Age, which is contemporaneous to our Neolithic period. These are literally highly developed kind of 
this shape that they use in the piece more than is represented through Chinese ceramics for thousands of years afterwards. But even at this early stage, I saw one archaeological dig where I think it was Harvard had gone to China, been given the runaround by the Chinese government, who I don't think wanted them there that much. But what they had discovered was a kiln that was allowing like literally mass production at this point in history. I realized when I saw the oracle bones and this writing system that this goes back to a period where these people were constructing things in bamboo and easily like matter that would kind of biodegrade very, very easily. So we have very little evidence. But one of the most striking things that occurred to me while I was doing this study was not only the role that Chinese civilization has played in the roots of our history, but the role that we have played in theirs. The Chinese ceramics that I associated with China as a little girl with the blue and white willow pattern tea sets. These were very much ceramics for Western taste and were a symptom of the colonization of China. The Boxer Rebellion is very much at the roots of modern Chinese identity um, in terms of their relationship with us. I didn't even learn about this at school. This was a full scale war fighting off the colonialism of us, you know, and this was really, really one of the other striking things that I found when I was studying China, when I moved away from looking at the Mongolian steppe and the Eurasian steppe and looking at China was how difficult it was to find Chinese academics. I don't have access to Chinese internet. I don't have access to Chinese academics. And there's clearly an economic, intellectual and technological revolution happening. And yet the two universities I've attended, Bradford and the LSE, have both been dependent on Chinese students. And I found this really, really interesting. Now, when we discuss the Silk Roads in this country, like we often seem to think that the Parthians, who were a Persian empire, had established relationships with China. And this was the first time there had been interaction between West and East. But what studying those biblical texts showed me was that these civilizations are much, much older and these connections are much, much older. And that what was occurring in the period of the Parthians was a wall falling down as a divide between West and East as a response to the Roman Empire. And I live in a country where we have been highly developed, highly dependent on Roman and Greco sources. So we have not seen that what's actually happened in the first century is not the opening of the Silk Roads, but the closing of them. And that when we're discussing the Silk Roads, we're actually discussing a complex network of political kind of relationships between political entities that goes from the Levant to China. That includes places like Bactria, which is modern day Afghanistan, where Iran, like the Persian civilizations are absolutely central to this. And in this period of time, which is the first time in our history that we can synthesize all these sources and build a multidimensional picture of human civilization, the thing that's actually going to stymie us is this two hemisphere world where Chinese academics can't access our shit and we can't access Chinese academics, not because of lack of desire or technology on the ground, but because of power games as the world adjusts to this multipolar world. Now, next Sunday, what I'm going to start to look at is ancient Mesopotamia. I'm going to look at the stories that are represented in the biblical narratives of Genesis as Adam and Eve. And I'm actually going to look at kind of the relationship between ancient Mesopotamia and this more ancient Neolithic China. But what I would say is I said that this was a video about Neolithic China. The question that's actually been raised for me here is how, back, how far back this civilization goes. Just the molding technology and just the artifacts that I've seen suggest that we're not talking a civilization that goes back to 10,000 BC, that we're talking about a civilization that may go back to 15, 20,000 BC. It occurs to me that the human species has had the capacity for thought and speech for 50,000 years. So it was always highly unlikely that our civilization just popped into existence at 4,000 BC. And over the course of this playlist, I'm going to look at civilizations like those in Central and South America and the Native Americans and look at the links between them and the Eurasian and Mongolian steppes. And I'm going to look at other civilizations and other parts of our civilization that maybe I haven't had chance to look at before because of this Western insular focus, the development of Persia. 
these relationships and entities, the development of the Islamic Empire. But next Sunday, I'll be looking at ancient Mesopotamia. And on Wednesday, I'll be looking at the relationship between the UK and the ES, um, the EU and the US, now that we're in a post-Trump, post-Brexit world, where the UK has to redefine their relationship with the world. Um, I've really very much enjoyed kind of I'm actually thrilled that people ask me to redo the history videos and that people I'm actually really really thrilled at that and I'm really excited to be doing this. I'm still crowdfunding £350 for materials, equipment to improve the quality of the videos but thank you very much for watching and I will see you on Wednesday.